Okay, so this was just a very short break. Uh, it was lovely to listen to Margit to see uh, really what is the, the German experience. I am also a German speaker. I'm originally from Austria. I uh, did my PhD at Salzburg University and I'm teaching systematic theology now uh, at KU Leuven. I've been in Belgium for five or six years. Uh, my original field is intercultural theology, post-colonial theology, so I'm really interested in cultural plurality within the Christian tradition. And I think this is a question that brings us very quickly to questions of how does the church work, right? So how do we also deal with plurality, diversity, and then contestation in the church? And this is something I would like to talk with you today. I just want to start by saying thank you for, for bringing this all together, Michael. Thank you for the invitation. It's been a real privilege and an honor uh, to listen and to learn together with you. And uh, I'll speak about 40 minutes, and I'll try to be fast and succinct and then have uh, time for questions and conversation. What I will do now in the next half hour or so is actually taking a step back. I won't be talking about synodality explicitly, and I won't be talking about women, women deacons explicitly. And I still think that what I will present to you has connects to the conversations we have had uh, and hopefully also contributes. So taking a step back is I want to think with you what it actually means to participate, what it means to include more voices into the deliberations, decision making and decision taking processes of the church. What does it mean to widen the circle uh, so that uh, the, the circle of those who represent the church? And I think these are really the questions at the heart of synodality. And we have seen this just yesterday when we talked about the, uh, the theme for the uh, meeting in Prague, which is enlarging the tent. So these are questions of inclusion, questions of who can participate. I will turn specifically to the question of women representation in the church and I will turn to a concrete case in which women have struggled for representation in the church. And based on that case, I will aim to outline some of the crucial political and theological questions that are at stake. So you will hear perhaps in my, converse, in my presentation that I consider politics and theology as inextricably entangled, and I'll try to outline how that actually works. Uh, I will show that there is no easy solution uh, that with which we can overcome the patriarchal tradition of the church. Uh, and my argument will be that women's participation in the church will always take place within the purview of its patriarchal clerical tradition, rather than actually overcoming that tradition. More broadly speaking, what I aim to contribute uh, by looking into my specific case that I will uh, outline, in, outline in more detail in a second. So what I aim to contribute here uh, to our shared reflections on synodality is the argument that for synodality to work, we will need a theology of conflict, which means a theology that does not all too quickly aim at overcoming uh, disagreement, at overcoming contestation in a church into a synodal path that we all walk in harmony. So I don't believe in that, and I think uh, we really need tools to deal with conflict not only politically, but also theologically. So we need a theology that can productively deal with conflict and take contestation in ecclesial tradition as a starting point for thinking about the church, but not only for thinking about what the church is, but also for, and I think this is for me the real, the crucial point of how revelation actually happens. Because when we talk about synodality, we speak a lot about the church, we speak about ecclesial practices, we speak about the relations within the church. And, I th and this is important, but I think we have heard so much yesterday that the actual question behind that, the genuine question behind that is for how the church, how can the church actually um, discern God's presence in the world? That is really the title of the synod. It is not about the church. It is about revelation. Where do we find God? And it's a secondary question of what kind of church do we need to find and discover God in the world? Uh, and so I'll try to pull all that together, and my argument will be we need to think theologically about conflict to, to have a proper understanding of how God 
how we encounter God in the world. I will start these reflections uh, with a concrete case uh, of a conflict. I'm not sure you remember Lucetta Scarafia. Excuse my Italian, I'm, I'm really, not even names work for me. Uh, but you might remember who she is. Uh, she was the editor-in-chief uh, of Donne Chiesa Mondo, which was, uh, or is actually, a monthly supplement to the Osservatore Romano that has been published since 2012. The goal uh, of this supplement is to grant a public voice to women in the church. And from 2012 to 2019, Lucetta was chair of the editorial staff. She had a team of 11 women, and she fulfilled this task with a passionate and an increasingly critical stance. And towards the end of her tenure, the magazine was also used as a platform to denounce the abuse of religious sisters and the oppression of women in the church. On March 26, 2019, the entire editorial team stepped back. This was an act of protest that achieved global attention uh, because uh, Scarafia uh, wrote an open letter to Pope Francis in which she outlined the reasons for her resignation. She says there had been increasing interference by the Osservatore's new editor, Andrea Monda, and a change in editorial direction had taken away her team's autonomy. Now Monda responded and he said that he was actually rebutting these accusations and he declared that he fully supported an independent publication of the women's magazine. So there's conflict also in, in the representation of that, of, um, of, of that stepping back. Similar discrepancies came to the fore in the commentaries on the resignation in international media. Many commentators saw in the developments around Donne Chiesa Mondo a proof for the continuing dominance of patriarchal clericalism in the, in the Roman Catholic Church. Yet, there were also more critical voices who questioned uh, Scarafia on her conservative positions and suggested that she might have felt threatened in her own exclusive position as the female voice of the Vatican by an increase of publication of women's articles uh, in the Osservatore under the leadership of Monda. Tina Beatty commented that, so she, she published a commentary in The Guardian, uh, and she captures these conflicts well. She writes about the resignation with regret and expresses her continuing solidarity. And yet, she has not actually uh, dismissed critique. She said, Scarafia's outspokenness has ruffled clerical feathers. But she has been also criticized by liberal Catholics for her conservatism with regard to church teaching on issues such as homosexuality. Some Italian feminists complain that she does not engage sufficiently with the views of women who are not part of her circle. So Beatty offers also a new nuanced position on the role that Monda has played in this dispute. Beatty says, an academic and journalist, Monda is not part of the clerical elite that wages war on Francis reforms. Another contact in the Italian media suggests, Beatty says, that Scarafia is perceived as being too close to the ancient regime and she has to go in order for real reform to take place. So reading Beatty's commentary, I think um, we have to see that her nuanced observations on the ambivalences in Scarafia's uh, public performance offer resources to think about conflict and contestation in the church. So there's ambivalences in that case, and I think when we look more closely, we can get kind of a segue into how we can think about conflict, contestation in the church. Her comments should not be understood as an attack ad hominem. Rather, Beatty's comments offer rich material to elucidate what I will call the political, the aesthetic, and the theological conditions of possibility for representation and participation in the church. My argument will be that conflicts such as this one uh, are a constitutive dimension of community building in the church. These conflicts are not an extraordinary disturbance that should ideally be overcome, 
until we all can speak on equal terms. Instead, I will suggest that they allow us to develop an understanding of community as a, what I will call a regime of in-stroke visibility or unstroke recognizability that is irreducibly marked and marked by asymmetries of power. So when we talk about the church, we will always talk about those who can be seen and those who are not seen, those who are recognized as ecclesial, as belonging to the church, and as those who are not recognized. I will explain that in more detail in a second. I will argue that these conflicts have a profound theological cogency that allow us to understand revelation and its representation through the church in new ways. Post-colonial studies, so this is my first love, my first theological love actually, offers first analytical tools for understanding that case in this way. In the struggle for non-colonial identities, post-colonial theory has developed a sensitivity for how colonial dominance uh, does not only take place through military power and economic exploitation, but is also irresolvably linked to what we could call epistemic violence, so a violence that shapes how we perceive power and what we per uh, how we perceive knowledge and what we perceive as knowledge, so epistemic violence. Colonial discourse sets the conditions under which knowledge is produced, disseminated, and evaluated. Edward Said, a Palestinian literary critic, has done groundbreaking work here. He showed how Orientalism is a scientific, cultural, political, aesthetic, economic, educational, and so on, discourse in which knowledge is produced in such a way that it perpetuates the power of colonial masters over the colonized. So knowledge is a tool of colonial power. Gayatri Spivak, an Indian post-colonial theorist, uh, wrote a very famous essay that's called Can the Subaltern Speak? So can those who are really at the lowest ranks, can they speak? And this is, I think, one of the core questions here is how can we speak? She has asked, she has written a very famous essay around that, uh, and her ultimate question was no, the subaltern, the lowest, those on the lowest ranks cannot speak. Uh, she looks into how col colonial patriarchal dominance informs <coughs> the representation of marginalized women and says, uh, and she says that when marginalized women speak, their speech is so inextricably bound up in asymmetrical relations of power and representation mm -hmm. that it is impossible to develop an authentic voice, an independent voice in those connections of power and knowledge. Post-colonial discourse does st struggles with a paradox. The struggle for representation takes place under the conditions of hegemonic discourse, so under the conditions of those who have power. <coughs> The hegemonic, what I call hegemonic discourse here, so the powerful discourse provides the framework within which marginalized voices can be heard and the, those in power remain the organizing principle that give form to the struggle for an authentic voice. I think that Scarafia's case demonstrates this dynamic in exemplary ways. BT hints at this when she suggests that Scarafia has maintained her position as one of the few women with a significant voice in the Vatican by way of a precarious balancing act between speaking out on issues of concern while refraining from challenging church teaching. In her public performance, Scarafia drew a clear line between the sayable and the unsayable in the church. These choices, I think, are best understood not simply as political maneuvering, but I think they provide a first glimpse at how profoundly established regimes of unrecognizability dictate the conditions of representation and participation. Scarafia speaking as a woman in the church <coughs> takes place within the normations of a patriarchal clerical discourse that silently but pervasively determines which topics can be addressed by whom and in which ways. 
This is also and particularly true for those who find themselves at the margins of this discourse and claim recognition from this marginal position. As Scarafia became increasingly bold, as Beattie formulated it, so as he became increasingly bold and sought to create recognition for topics that were silenced within the normative boundaries that make that, 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 that uh, constitutes the church, she got out of line uh, of what is seeable uh, and what is understandable within the church, and she could eventually only become silent herself. So we can further elucidate these insights with the help of Jacques Rancière's political philosophy. So I'll pick up one of the kind of themes that have emerged here, uh, the call for an interdisciplinary analysis. And I would actually like to turn to political philosophy of power uh, to understand what is at stake here and to see how we can actually theologize based on uh, political philosophy that thinks about these issues of representation. Jacques Rancière is my conversation partner of choice, a French um, political philosopher. For Rancière, politics and aesthetics interlock in the constitution of how a community shapes its world. Communities, he says, constitute political order through what he calls a distribution of the sensible. The distribution of the sensible are the practices of differentiation through which a community defines what it considers as visible, sayable, and meaningful. So there is a, the, the community decides, this is what we hear, this is what we see, and there's always an underbelly to that. When a community decides we can see that, this is, this is, it's not a decision, we can see that. The community sees certain things, and that means there's always that inclusion always includes an exclusion as well. Anything that is seeable means, means that we, there are certain things we do not see. When certain things are seeable, that means that other things are unseeable. And this is why he actually, and, and so he says there are certain people who belong to that community, who are seen in this community, and others are not seen in that community, they do not belong. So the two takeaway points here are there's always, an, as I think communities uh, take their shape through processes of inclusion, and that means there's processes, simultaneously processes of exclusion, uh, and that is a process that he describes as an aesthetic process. So the question of how do we see is also a political process, is who belongs, who has representation and participation in a community based on these aesthetic decisions of what we as a community see or do not see. And I think the crucial point here is that firstly, representation and participation within a community rest on the exclusion of those who have no share, right? So inclusion rests on those who do not have a share. And secondly, that Rancière actually gives this share of the excluded a name. Those who do not count and those who are not accounted for are, he calls them, the part of those who have no part, <laughs> right? So he calls them by that name that they have. He further argues, and I think this is also important uh, as we move on to theologizing around this, he further argues that there are two ways of how, of how the part that has no part in a community can be counted, right? The first part, or the first way, counts the parts that constitute the community. And that way recognizes those groups and only those groups that actually have a share in that community. That way of counting proceeds in a totalitarian way that reflects precisely the particular arrangements of visibility that are operative in a given community. Rancière calls this way of counting consensus. Consensus. This census then is the second way of counting that additionally names a community's part of no part and thus inserts a gap that marks the excluded within that established order, right? So he says dissent 
is a way of looking at community that shows that any kind of inclusion is based on excluded ones. So to, to any, any community has a group that is excluded and they normally remain invisible. Through dissent, or what Rancière calls dissent, this way, this, this part of the excluded becomes visible. And the crucial point here is that when this part of no part is named, dissent does not simply add a part that has hitherto been missing, but it introduces a fundamentally different perception of reality that disrupts the totalitarian order of consensus and questions the normality of the arrangements of invisibility. So consensus says, this is the community, this is what we see, and the census is not, no, we need to include another bit, but it says, no, you always rest on the exclusion, and it, it disrupts what we consider as normal here. Rancière allows us to argue that the struggle for recognition within an established totalitarian regime of recognizability does not actually bring real transformation. Such struggle does not affect a constitutive change in the regulations for the visibility, the sayability, and realizability of selected forms of life. So when we just struggle for, for participation in what is already given, we don't change the world of that community fundamentally. On the contrary, such a struggle for a redistribution of representation within a hegemonic regime ultimately rests on a consensus about what and who is already considered visible and invisible in ways that leave no place for a void. So it does not make visible that there's always a gap, that the excluded are always part of a community. It therefore does not unsettle, but actually reinforce the existing distribution of the sensible and the selection of those who have a share in that community. When Donna Chiesa Mondo struggled for the recognition of women in the church, it found itself precisely in that precarious position. And it also shows that the exclusion of the part of those without part is not actually necessarily achieved through mechanisms of silencing and concealing. Rather, uh, these processes of excluding can also uh, of, of, yeah, of, of exclusion, perhaps, can also be performed through mechanisms of hypervisibility. The launching of uh, the magazine did not actually affect a fundamental recognition of what, uh, uh, sorry, when uh, Donne Chiesa Mondo was launched, it did not actually, I think, uh, lead to a fundamental renegotiation of who can be seen in the church and what is sayable in the church. Rather, the women's, theme, women's themes here were granted recognition at the margins of the order of the clerical church here in ways that did not actually fundamentally question the distribution of representation in the church. On the contrary, the hypervisibility of the women's magazine that was published as an addendum to the normal Osservatore Romano silently re-established the dominant male clerical form of representation in the Vatican as normative and normal, right? So it wasn't described as the male part or the female part, it was just the normal way of communication. Then we have a hyper-visible uh, forum for women's voices. A struggle for an increased recognition of women in the church does not unsettle its patriarchal consensus. Rather, when we really want to have an effective transformation of pa patriarchal cler clericalism, we would really need a scrutiny of the patterns of toxic masculinity that have shaped and continue to shape the church. So one of my first arguments here is that we shouldn't actually talk about women, but we should talk about the silent, the normativized clerical masculinity that shape what is the church and what we consider as church. Rather than trying to fit women into that frame, we have to first expose what that frame is, what kind of power shapes it, and what kind of exclusions uh, are ingrained into that structure. Hence, and going, coming back to my case here, not until the entire female editorial staff resigned did Donne Chiesa Mondo unsettle the normal order of things in the church. <laughs> 
Only their clamoring silence made the women visible as those who are absent from the patriarchal consensus in the church. In the women's resignation, a void, a gap, appeared in the normal ecclesial order of things for those who have no part in the distribution of the sensible of the church. That resignation disturbed the consensual mechanisms with which the clerical patriarchal regime normally sustains its self-evidence. And momentarily, it disturbed the consensual me mechanisms with which the clerical regime normally sustains its self-evidence and deprived these mechanisms momentarily of their efficacy. Hence, only as the women ostentatiously relinquished their claim for consensual representation in the church, only then was the normal ecclesial order uh, momentarily disrupted and it made fleeting space for renegotiating of who counts and what counts as recognizable in the church. Sorry, just to have Zoom going on here as well. So. Uh -huh. Very good. A struggle for an increased recognition of women in the church um, does not unsettle its patriarchal cons consensus. Sorry. Um, oh, yeah. So, Scarafia's case does points us to an ambivalence, and I would argue it's an irresolvable ambivalence in the struggle for women's and other non-men's recognition in the church. That case indicates that the struggle to gain recognition within the established ecclesial structures runs the risk of reinforcing the sovereignty of these structures and of perpetuating the asymmetries in the distribution of power uh, within that system. Only that silence had a potentially transformative effect. And this is, I think, a precarious result for the struggle of recognition, uh, and it's a result that underlines what Rancière highlights repeatedly. He says that a rupture in the normal order of things, so that descent that brings a, no a rupture in the normal order of things, is the condition for the possibility of transformation but it does not automatically lead to more just or to more inclusive structures. Uh, structures. Dissent, and this is the crucial point here, dissent does not replace the established order of things, but is critically at work within it. It is what Rosier calls an accidental, local, and precarious activity that is always close to disappearing, but therefore also always close to reappearing. So there is the structures, and our hope, I think, should not be for replacing the structures for them to make them more inclusive, more just, but to look for disruptions of, the just, of that, those structures that first show us that they are shaped by power. And in showing their contingency, in showing the powerful exclusions that they're based on, we open up perhaps transformations towards more, more just structures, but not in a way that they can just be replaced. This, of course, is a precarious outcome. It shows that women's struggle for representation in the church is faced with the prospect of ultimate failure. And yet, such recognition of failure to effect an ambivalent transformation is, I would argue, not a relinquishing of hope. Rather, and with this I would like to take Rancière into a theological direction, I would like to suggest that we can take from the story resources for a renewed understanding of revelation and its representation in the church. Rancière himself, not a theologian, but he hints at the theological cogency of his political philosophy when he cites Plato to describe the demos, the part uh, uh, that has no part, as God's part. And when he maintains that the part that has no part contains with it uh, within it all that is theological in politics. So Rancière points us to that part of no part and says, is there actually some theological, something theological to be learned uh, from looking at exclusions and what exactly can we, look, can we learn here? With these political theological intuitions, um, his approach offers an instructive language for reading biblical accounts of God's presence in the part of those without part. 
And I would like to turn to a passage here that has come up also in the morning quite a bit, quite a bit Christ Anonymous, the Christ who is visible in the poor, in the hungry, in those who are in prison, and so on. So the anonymous Christ, the presence of Christ, in the excluded one. Um, according to the scriptures here, I think we can see, uh, reading it with Rancière, that Revelation also appears as a constellation of those who we can see and those who we cannot see. Uh, and that those constellations of visibility and invisibility are irresolvably tied to political processes of in and exclusion. Biblically, when we go to that passage the politic of Matthew 25, the political locus of social invisibility is the preferred theological locus for revelation of God. Those who are excluded from society are of indispensable significance for the appearance of God. Matthew 25 here is one of the many passages that speak prominently of the anonymous presence of Christ in those that find themselves in the blind spots of a community. And Matthew 25 here also unmistakably links the ability to see God to uh, an undoing of political aesthetic exclusion. So we see God when we see Christ in the excluded ones. God comes into view whenever there's a conflict about who can be seen and what can be said about them. Have we not fed you when you were hungry? Have we not visited you in prison? So that's a question of uh, who do we see first and what do we see in them? And that is a theological question of where do we find revelation? And that is a question of negotiation also of who we see. And whenever that conflict happens, Matthew 25, I think, argues uh, when that conflict happens of who have we seen here, God appears. This is the site of God's revelation. So with Rancière, we can say that whenever the totalitarian ways of counting the parts of a com community are disrupted and a void appears, a gap appears, God can be seen when the normal order of who is visible momentarily fails and the possibility for new arrangements of visibility fleetingly appears in the cracks that open up them. Hence, when we theologically attune a politics of dissent, revelation does no longer appear as a self-evident presence in the church, right? But it is also not simply found in a theological utopia of eschatological deferral. So no longer the church has revelation, but also no longer well, we all march together towards ever greater revelation of God uh, in the eschaton. Rather, with Bradley Johnson, we can argue that a political theology of dissent suggests reconceiving revelation within an apocalyptic framework. So not as the catastrophic end of the world, but more literally um, ap apocalyptic as the unveiling of a new creation from, and this is the crucial point for me here, from and in the midst of the normal order of things. Such a theological reading of Rancière unsettles the binary conceptions of transcendence and immanence. Revelation becomes an event that appears in the midst of our world. It, uh, it is an emergent event that grasps revelation as an occurrence that is immanent to the world, really takes place in the world, but is still radically different from the normal order in the world. Rather than assuming an apparently self-evident and stable difference between immanence and transcendence that can be either preserved then in the absolutized church or safeguarded through eschatological deferral, transcendence here is tied into the embodied histories of contestation in which selected forms of life are seen and other lives are not seen. Uh, through the lens of such a theology of dissent, Transcendence appears fleetingly whenever such dissent happens, whenever we ask, who do we see actually? Where are those who we do not see? So that's where revelation, that's where God's presence happens. And in these conflicts about who we can see, uh, we have new beginnings without innocence, is what I would like to call that, new beginnings without innocence. So revelation takes place in the world and it takes place as something that opens up new possibilities, but not as 
a new start that completely forgets what has happened before, completely erases a history of conflict, but is at work within those conflicts as new beginnings without innocence. When we situate transcendence as this rupture within the normal order of things, we can then use the theology of descent to understand transcendence uh, as something that has transformative effects already, right? So Johnson here, I'm quoting here, he says that the experience of transcendence becomes transformative now. We don't wait for the revelation of God to appear in the eschaton to be a different world there, but it is a momentary, a fleeting event that is transformative now as an occurrence that emerges not at the end of time, but by the attention we pay to that and to those who are constitutively silenced. At the same time, however, such a relocation of transcendence in the fleeting performances of when that descent happens, it deprives the transformative experience of the transcendence of God of its unambiguity. So there's no longer a way where we can say, this is revelation and this is not revelation. But revelation is tied really into these conflicts of, well, who belongs and who doesn't belong. Also, Matthew 25 shows that in exemplary ways, uh, how, that, how the, the revelation of God's presence is irresolvably, but perhaps not irredeemably tied into the struggle for recognition. Matthew 25 speaks of the appearance of God in that rearrangement of who we see as uh, recognizable, but it also mentions those who hold on to the established consensual distribution of the sensible and of those who only see those who have a share in it without leaving that place for a gap. For those who are blind to the descent with which the part of those without part appears, a vision of God is foreclosed. Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? So those who are blind to those conflicts do not actually see God. Emerging from those ruptures in the normal order of things, God's revelation is never self-evident, but it remains irresolvably tied to renegotiations of who is visible and therefore revelation is ambivalent and it appears ambivalently. Isaiah 43 here says, I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? So again, here a question of, of we don't know uh, an ambivalently where God is. And I'm now coming to my final point, and that is uh, towards a dissenting church, because revelation theology ties into ecclesiology, the way we understand revelation. And the point I wanted to make here is revelation takes place in this world as something that we cannot uh, decisively or e easily decide of it has happened or not. What kind of church can we build on that revelation? I think that makes for a church as a silent instrument of such ruptures that take place in the established distributions of the church within and outside the church. So the church, the real church, let me put it, is not uh, a fixed institution anymore. It is not outside the church either, but the church takes place when it becomes silent instrument of this descent uh, as it ruptures what we perceive as normal, both within the order of the church and outside the order of the church. It cuts through it in a way. Living up to its raison d'etre of giving witness to God's presence, the church becomes a sacrament of failure that is called to identify the fleeting moments in which the transformative experience of God's transcendence becomes present as new beginnings without innocence in the midst of our realities. It becomes, or it, it, it's a way of understanding the church as such a disturbance in the normal order of things, and it always remains provisional. So it cannot be institutionalized, or such kind of dissent cannot be institutionalized, but it is critically at work within institutions, within the church, but also within other institutions, uh, as it is, appears in the fleeting exposure of the normative epistemic violence in existing institutions. And therefore, uh, and such a recognition of revelation as a rupture in 
what we in, no, in the normal order of things, presents us with a criterion for ecclesiality that ties the church irresolvably into struggles for recognition. And therefore also not only revelation uh, doesn't have any self-evidence uh, anymore, but also it's not completely clear where the church is, right? So again, that kind of dissolves the borders of where the church is. And we have to ask, well, has church taken place in that particular instance or not? So we get a very, uh, I think, a different understanding of church that kind of can, we can work critically with as we deal with the institution, the established institution of the church. So we have here, and this is um, uh, indeed my conclusion, we have resources here for ecclesiological reconfigurations in which the church and participation and representation within the church are no longer considered as self-evidently visible, um, but, uh, or they're not, no longer self-evidently available goods over whose more or less just distribution we can wrestle. Rather, church is reconceived as an event that becomes a representation of God's transformative presence whenever and wherever established constellations of invisibility are called into question. So theologically speaking, speaking the struggle for recognition in the church goes beyond a competition over who can say what in the church. Uh, it does, so we don't just want to be included in the church, but we need to ask first of, uh, well, how did that regime of invisibility uh, take its shape first? It shifts to the theologically more fundamental question of where church is momentarily taking place in ruptures of self-evidence. Church no longer appears as self-evident, but it calls for practices of discernment that register moments of dissent, of new beginnings without innocence in the midst of our order of things here. And maybe I will just like to conclude here by returning to uh, the women, the glamouring silence of the women of Donachy as a mondo, by asking, is that perhaps that silence one of those moments where transcendence has happened and where church has happened? Might church have happened in this dispute? I think such a reading of the women's resignation as a possible instance of ecclesiogenesis is not unambivalent. It can easily be subsumed into a long ecclesial tradition that draws on theological patterns of interpretation that have justified the silence of women and other non-men in the church. The glorification of women's silence has long been part of a patriarchal discourse in a clericalized church that draws on sa sacralized violence to sponsor uh, the invisibility of non-male forms of ecclesial life. Hence, such a theology of dissent, my argument was only in the silence have those women spoken, but that's of course a dangerous argument to make as well. Uh, the women's resignation can be dignified theologically as a moment of ecclesiality, this bears its own risks, of course. And yet at the very same time, and thus in irreducibly ambivalent ways, that silence has ecclesiological sig significance and it can reveal a renewed understanding of church. It offers building blocks towards a dissenting church in which and through which transformation could indeed, indeed take place, never unambivalently, never uncontested, never totally and still effectively. And it is with this view towards transformation uh, through conflict that we can take from the Scarafia case that I would like to conclude. If we do not immediately subject this dispute and its ecclesiological signif significance to the established patriarchal routines in the church and instead stay a little longer with the trouble that they present, this momentary rupture of silence uh, inflicted on the totalizing mechanisms of a patriarchally hier hierarchized church, it indicates in which ways we can perhaps reform uh, towards a dissenting church. By way of example, the women's perhaps failed struggle for recognition shows that ruptures in the normal order of things expose the irreducible workings of normative violence in the ecclesial tradition. So the first step is to make visible that violence actually takes place in uh, we decide of who belongs and who, who does not belong. We have to first actually denaturalize those boundaries. 
Um, so they, they, they expose the irreducible workings of epistemic violence in ecclesial tradition. But they promise no deliverance from the powerful mechanisms that determine some forms of life as recognizable and some as not. And yet they think such failure to offer a clear way ahead does not dispense from efforts for reform that seek to undo the normative violence which sponsors those regimes of who can be visible and invisible. On the contrary, we can perceive such failure as the theological locus of revelation, the ecclesiological locus of where church happens, and the political locus of transformative agency. It is through failure that reform in the church can take place. Failure resists institutionalization. It does not simply replace ecclesial institutions, but it is critically and fleetingly at work within them. So the theological significance of failure can call the church to establish forms and leadership styles that allow it to fail again. So this is another Irish author here. We have Samuel Packett. We need ways of failing better. We need ways of failing again and again and seeing the potential of those failures. It calls for a post-heroic ecclesiopolitics that can embrace the transformative potential of failure. And such a reform through failure will reconstitute the church as democracy, not in the sense that Benedict and Francis have warned when they highlighted that the consensus fidelium cannot be equated with, uh, with a democracy, with the, the majority opinion, but rather in Rossier's sense, who speaks of democracy as a momentary state of exception in which the violent mechanisms of inclusion and exclusion fail and other possibilities become visible. As such a demo democracy, the church will not pursue the utopian goal of a space free of hierarchy, a space free of power, but it is called to register the disruptive and potentially transformative power of failures in the normal order of things to maintain their self-evidence. Through such a conflictive approach, a dissenting church continues to struggle to expose normative or epistemic violence, knowing that it will fail again and again. A dissenting church represents God in new beginnings without innocence. I would like to thank you very much for your patience. <laughs>